Okay, let's start. What is an entrepreneur? I was asked to talk a bit about entrepreneurs. An entrepreneur is a word that means you're going to work, and work you will, take risk, and be disappointed. And all those bits have been in abundance over the last 25 years, I can tell you. Why do we work? What's it about? And that's probably the thing that we're really trying to come to terms with is you spend a long time at work, you choose what you do, what is it you're trying to get out of life? And if you spend a long time driving back and forth to work in an environment that's not conducive to good life and you're not sort of getting fulfilled in that space, then that's probably not helping you either. It's just doing the work turnover. So can we make the environment a better environment to live in going forward? To do that, we've got to reduce our energy footprint, we've got to reduce our impacts on the rest of the world, we've got to really think about how we become much smarter. According to Peter Sondergaard earlier last year, data is the oil of the future, and I fully agree, there's probably coal in this space and oil in other spaces, that's right. And we like to think of ND as being a refinery. It's a place that can be anywhere, moved across, take that oil and turn it into something really good. Sorry. <laughs> Go through. Okay, ah, I'll probably get that one. Right at the top, the why. Why is ND doing what he's doing? We really want to empower universal good through data. That's what we're really trying to see through. And it does, it feels good to be part of it, to be part of that space. Um, yeah. A little bit of a <coughs> sojourn, slightly but not, which explains something about the life we're living now. A bicycle is 30 times more efficient than a car. But if you, the calories you burn up are actually more expensive to buy as food than the petrol. Car faster, car you don't get wet. So we live in a lifestyle where fossil fuels very much subsidise how we live or just support how we live. If we want to get to a fossil fuel free environment, we've got to change a whole heap of things. Okay? Cobb & Co, the sheep is back in telecom. So, Cobb & Co coach to take 100 kilos of letters to Tamworth, say, would take probably 10 horse days, generate probably about 700, use about 700 kilowatt hours of power to get up there, generate about 800 tonne, 800 kilograms, sorry, of CO2 equivalent gas. A car would do it in much less time, would use about half the energy and generate an eighth of the gas. Telecom, which was sponsored off the sheep's back by the government years ago when we had money and they had, had, had insight, etc., etc., does all that for very little now. So we transfer information all over the world at a very low energy cost in comparison to what we've got. So as a society, we can move from high energy usage to much less use energy usage if we're clever about how we use data. Big data insights. So the telcos capture where you are all the time over the you know, base, so the whole information comes out of that. BMW no longer calls itself a car manufacturer. It's now a digital um, data analysis group because that's what they do. They sit down and work through that whole process. Okay. Internet of Things is coming through and hospitals, which we'll talk about a bit later on, which traditionally used to collect stuff, 15 minute readings on a pad and write it down and go through that sort of stuff, is really transferring through. So there's a high new data coming in. The power of that big data insight stuff when you come to things like planning is that you can actually sit down and work out how many people went to an event, when they arrived, where they came from, where they went back to, in terms of that whole space. So in terms of trying to plan a city, you get a much better handle on where you're going. Data capture is doubling every two years and it's probably going much faster than that. That was about a year ago when we were talking about that. Cisco reckon by 2020 there's going to be 50 billion connected devices out there capturing data. It's huge coming in. Having a look at the market predictors and analytics predictors, core technologies in big data are growing at about 24% compound annual growth rate. It's enormous. But that's what's happening in that space. In ND, we sit in that space, we do precision data analytics with scale, and we're very pleased to be in that space. Gartner in 2017 had a look at seven dynamic, seven factors influencing data analytics market going forward. And we sat and designed our NDD platform back in 2012 or so and set out all the fundamentals that we wanted to achieve, guiding principles, Andrew Gooden was heavily involved in that. When we go and compare what we've done and what we can do to this list, we tick all of those boxes going through. Many of our competitors might tick one or two, but we can tick all of those boxes. 
That, from a market research point of view, makes us feel very comfortable. Um, in terms of the other metric that Steve and I've used, Steve Craig in the back end, and I've used over the last couple of years is because we're not generating a lot of revenue at this point in time, how do you actually measure success or not success? The presentation metric is a fairly good one. I don't know how many presentations we've done where you start in a conversation and people don't really want to be there, but about a third of the way through the conversation they've moved in and by the end of it you can't get out of the place. Probably one of the best ones we ever had was we were saying to some solar industry guys live a 3D model and spinning it in space. This is going back a year and a half, two years ago. And the guy was on the video on the other end and you just saw his jaw drop. That was gold. And we really wish we'd captured that going forward. We had had one negative response and I found out later that that guy is gives negative responses as a standard thing. He'd had a slightly rough time because a certain German chancellor had seen a supercomputer that she shouldn't have seen and his job was uh, moved a little bit after that. So anyway, lots of things fit in that space. The other thing that makes us reasonably confident in Ndidi is the versatility of the platform that we've developed. We've been doing projects that no one else in the world can do and I'll take you through a couple of those later on. Actually, we'll talk about them right now. Geoscience Australia had a hyper waveform LIDAR and point cloud LIDAR, LIDAR huge 50,000 50, kilometres squared of data. Somehow they disconnected the two, they should be linked. We sat down and wrote some code to actually go back and collect each one of those 120 billion waveforms and LIDAR points. There's a project we're doing in Central America where, I think I've talked, some of you have heard about this a little bit, they were capturing LIDAR across 5,500 kilometres square to try and pick up the terrain and where there's buildings and all that sort of stuff. Problem was they had a fair bit of, um, I don't know whether it was a drug lord, but guerrilla interference in terms of guns and people, their survey equipment moving and being taken away and all the rest of it. There was a data set that could never be recaptured. Well, no one was really game to go back and try and recapture it. We've been able to process that from scratch, fix it and pull the information out they want. But the configurability of our platform allowed us to do that. Our standard routines wouldn't have done any of that. We had to rewrite stuff. My journey, a little bit about six decades of observation. Who said a little knowledge is dangerous? Um, if I go back, I did a degree, I'm well, sorry, did, studied natural resources and engineering at Newcastle. <coughs> I went to Newcastle, sorry, I went to Armidale Uni, and after two years off after school, and then go to Armidale Uni, got there, walked into the library, and was overwhelmed. I sat down on a chair and said, there's no way on earth I'm ever going to read all this stuff. So what is it I'm going to contribute to life? There's nothing for me to contribute. Um, it depressed me quite a bit because I'd sort of waited to get there and all this. I sat in the corner for a while and I realised that everything that was in those books has come from other people's observations. And so if we observe, then we can probably contribute something. So I continued on and did a few good things. Um, founded Unlock in 1993 and again, set up a business that I wanted to have a flat structure, I wanted it to be more like a family sort of unit and we did that pretty well for about 15 years, we sort of outgrew it after a while but it worked well. Unlock evolved in an era when community was driven by the natural resources we use and we were focused on trying to use them more efficiently and fit into the community and all that sort of stuff. And DD is that transition past that to where we use data to help fund or help reduce that natural resource usage going forward. 25 years of just solving real world environmental problems and 18 years of working on geospatial problems, which I'll take you through a few. The entrepreneur bit of it, Williams River Regional Environmental Study, was actually uh, run by a department of planning. I had a staff of a uh, company of one at the time. All the major environmental consultants had had four weeks to prepare a quote for that. I asked if I could, got a wild card with one week to go, wrote a proposal for it won the job. Before we started that job, they decided, Hunter Waterpot had been doing a lot of work in the Williams River, and decided that the dairy cattle and the beef cattle were contributing all the nutrients to the Williams River system, which was coming through. Now, we sat back and used a thing called pro um, <coughs> processes and drivers, which is something I've been working on in my master's work, and broke up the attachment into its individual components and then looked what contributed to it, etc., etc. It turned out, that the phosphorus that had been deposited in the bottom of sea and weir from barracking tops over the last eon of years, because they put sea and weir in there, it stopped the flow. Because they stopped the flow, it started to deoxygenate down the bottom, and that phosphorus in the bed sediments was mobilising out into the water column and causing all the algal blooms and bits and pieces. But if we'd not gone through that sort of process, they would have got it wrong. 
that for. Man Long Flood Study was probably the first real effort at doing big data. So this is about four kilometres by three kilometres. Back in 2000, we developed a finite element mesh. We got delivered the LiDAR for this from the suppliers. They'd thinned it to 1% of the data they needed to use, of the data they captured. That 1% wasn't good enough for us to do the job. So we then had to work out how to use 100% and go through. And that's where the thinking about PAN and big data really started. Newcastle coastline. Well, this is a bit topical at the moment, but it's something we've worked through. We did the Newcastle Coastline Management Plan back in, um, um, back in 2000, and one of the challenges was what was happening off Stockton Beach at the time. So the consensus at that time was that the erosion off Stockton Beach was cyclic and that it was just big storms and things and it would go through that. So we went back to the archives and pulled out all the bathymetry that we could find going back to 1816. So 1816, pretty sparse. Your finger. That's about the level of data we have. <coughs> this is Stockton. This used to be all oyster beds over on that side. This is about two families deep through that whole area. It's quite shallow through that area. By the time we got to 1866, there was a lot more data out there. They started to seriously look at what was going on. Probably the other interesting bit was Robbie's wasn't connected at that point in time. Robbie's was still an island going through, but I won't take you through all that. So the general consensus was that this erosion off Stockton Beach that we're talking about now was like, what I'll do now is just take you through a series of slides over time to show you what happened. So not a lot of data at this point in time, but this is Hunter River, Stockton on that side. A bit more data in 1851, 1866, and you'll see is now being connected. Part of the northern break wall is just starting to be thought about. A bit more. Northern break wall is starting to be constructed. That's the northern break wall, 1913, 1921. And you can see that just the beds drop, but I'll go through that. 1926, start to stabilise a bit. 1950, 1957. 1988, they deepened the harbour. 1995, 2000. By 2000, between 1921 and 2000, 20 million metres cubed of sand that's gone from that area we're looking at in that space. It's not cyclic. Okay, I'll just run through that one more time without talking. So if you just watch what happens to the bed. So getting good data and being able to visualise it properly answers a lot of questions very fast. One of the other things that led to ND being like it is now is we did a project in um, Murrumbidgee, just north of Grizzlers. And they were trying to work out how to minimise the amount of water that the farmers were using for irrigation. When we got down there and started looking, most of the farmers were already only using about three megalitres a hectare, which is pretty damn good, right? It's pretty low. So we went about building this model of what crop types were where and what the vegetation looked like and what the topography was. We got rainfall information for 30 years and uh, evaporation data for 30 years, and we built a dynamic model of the whole system. Once we built that model, we actually didn't focus on minimising water, we focused on maximising return for the water you use. Because you knew what the crops were worth, you knew when they were going to come to market, and so we completely changed the way that they were thinking about the water usage going into that space. Just another way of We were doing all of that on one computer, or a couple of computers if we were lucky. So in about 2010 we went and bought 26 ex-government computers at $1.60 each. <laughs> <laughs> Wired them all together and then basically wrote a program that allowed us to distribute all the processing across all these computers, which was the start of NDD as it is now. All right. Had 52 CPUs, 104 gigabytes of RAM, and was the biggest fire hazard out there. One of those things <laughs> melted down one time and the room got to 45 degrees by the time I got to it. All right, that's just one of them, so, yeah. But it taught us how to distribute stuff and how to do dynamic loading and a whole range of other things. And that little computer box was there, allowed us to go from Mandalong, which was a million points, to another project, including all actual projects in 2016, which was 10 million times bigger than Mandalong in that space. And that's the sort of stuff we can process because of the way we distribute this stuff. Uh, Andrew calls it the Hillbilly supercomputer, but <coughs> <laughs> I call it a fly track. Okay, so once we've got all that ability to handle data and process it and do those sorts of things, we can actually start to think carefully about the sorts of tasks we can, other, we can work on. We've been doing some work for OEH, trying to, Office of Environment Heritage, trying to help them with flood studies and use the LIDAR that LPI have been connected to try and do that better. 
We were classifying LIDAR and written our own LIDAR classification system and our own alignment system for it and all that sort of stuff. We got told that it was impossible to find Nunnikau mounds using LIDAR and there'd been a couple of papers written on it at the end of early 2010. So we thought that's a challenge. And one of the mining companies came to us and said, can you find mounds? Sure, we can find mounds. Always, sure, not a problem. So we set about doing it. Now, to do this, those mounds can sometimes be that high, and the LIDAR is plus or minus that. And the point spacing on those things is about two metres or a metre apart. Why do you need to find Mali Fowl mounds? Okay, I can answer that. Because Mali Fowl is a threatened species. Oh, All right. Okay. And so the government are very interested in it. The Commonwealth government in particular, but the local governments. And mining companies are very interested in it because they can't get approvals unless they know what's going on in that space. Okay, so. Valleyfell Mound in real world, Valleyfell Mound in digital world, Valleyfell Mound in the way that our people see it. So what we did was we wrote a patented algorithm to look at the rate of change of slope and then certain features of that rate of change of slope. And if you look high, sorry, the way it's written and the way it's been presented here is that the things that are closest to Valleyfell Mounds are bright white and the things that are further away are blue. Okay, so that's a theme that goes through this stuff. So there's one there and there's one right there. Okay? To try and sort through all that stuff is impossible. To convert what you're looking at to a way you can see it, it comes up very quickly. It's not a bad bit of art. That one's a bit fuzzy because it's been blown up too many times, but it okay. So the system we've put together basically allows us to take many forms of data, combine them. This is our workflow on that side, and it's, that workflow is plug and drop and can be changed to do whatever it needs to do. We then produce outputs that people can see in the GIS if they need it, or we don't need to go to that state, and we can drop it out to where they can work with it. And from that, we can process it into a bar chart. Just as simple as that. And the idea is that we read data once, we do all the processing, and we output it once. One of the big challenges with data, huge data sets, is it takes about 50% of the time to process it, it's just reading it in the first place. And many of the systems that are out there at the moment are read one and then they export it out and they put it in another pipeline and export it out and put it in another pipeline and export it out and put it in another pipeline and export it out from there. So that becomes really inefficient. So we've got some significant efficiency through that space. We also worked out through our processing that we could run this thing on a supercomputer. And we've been running our, this on a supercomputer at the Cynet one in Canada, Canada for a while. And we get something like 97% super U usage out of that supercomputer. They're typically getting about 40%. And that's running our stuff on their bare metal because we're clever about how we process all that through. That sort of process allows us to do a whole heap of things, such as this is Melbourne, which is a <coughs> city in, Western Australia, in Perth, Western Australia, 53 kilometres squared. We've gone through and looked at where the trees are, what height they are, where they're in private land, park land, whatever else, and all the statistics. And so there's 97 graphs that come off this telling you all about all the bits and pieces that go through. We can also go through and look at things like proximity of trees to houses. Okay. And we can do that on scale. So this is telling us red trees within 10 metres, brown is 15, well, it's 20 metres, and beyond that's green, okay, going out through. But we can do that on scale with this stuff. We can also pick out individual roof planes, which is a nice thing to be able to do, and we've been working on that for a while. Okay. That allows us to look at things like shade analysis. And so building in the middle. This is the solar potential of that building, taking into account what happens during a day and taking into account the shading from the trees all around it. Now, when we first processed that, it took us about 26 minutes to do 100 metres by 100 metres to get the ray analysis to tell us what the shading was. That's too slow if you're trying to serve it up as an app. So everyone, the guys who are working on it went about, and they're doing that in seconds now, which works well in real time. But that's the sort of improvement we had to get through. We can do it on a house basis, we can do it on a neighbourhood basis, we can do it on a whole suburb basis, we can do it on a city basis. And all that is the same process, it's all automated. Are you right? selling that as a, as a service at the moment? It's here, yeah. very close. So that's our app for the solar component of it. We do something similar for property and other bits and pieces, but it's allowing us now to position solar panels on the roof and basically work out exactly what it is. They're the, some of the verticals we're focusing on at this point in time. So, construction, solar industry, infrastructure, property, mining, <coughs> environment, and recreation. So, we're doing a bit of work with the orienteering group out of Australia or across Australia in sort of helping refine use for lighter and stuff in that space as well. 
This is our team that made all that first bit happen. <coughs> so we've grown from about nine to about 18 in the last six to 10 months, which is interesting. We have a really diverse team. So we have seven graduates from Newcastle Uni, which is one thing. We have a guy from India, a guy, a French Canadian, a Russian, a guy from China, a lady from Norway, <laughs> I always get that confused with the running through it, a guy from South Africa, and then a modern crew of the rest of us. So there's a whole heap of different cultures that fit into that space. And it's been really interesting working through it. In the last probably 12 or probably two weeks or so, the team's gone from being groups of people to a gelled team. That's really pleasing to see. So we're doing a fair bit of work with being more human, Michelle and Crystal, about trying to develop an organisation chart that's a 3D dynamic chart. It actually represents the skills that the people are bringing to the tasks that are being done. And ultimately what I'd like to be able to do is track that to something like our timesheets, so that over a year we'll show you some nice time series graphics, but you see the time series graphics of who did what where over time, okay, going through it. It becomes a useful tool rather than this thing to stick up on the wall and say, it's shall be degree. We've got, as I said, a flat structure, and by, I'm not sure, intelligent design or by just good luck, we have about 30% overlap between the skill sets of all the people that are in there. And that's just a nice overlap to have enough buffer but still be lean and agile going through it. We're a great group, we can come. This is where we are at the moment. That's our um, Trialba building. That was for me, from an entrepreneur's side, 10 years in the planning, two years of battling with builders to build. It's an environmentally sustainable building. It's a five-star neighbours, and they don't take into account three-quarters of the things that the building's got in it, but that's another story. It's something I invested my heart and soul in, and I'm not the company that we grew over 25 years, was another part of me investing my heart and soul. Both of those things I will move away from so that MDD can get to where it needs to get to in the very near future. This is where we're heading to. <laughs> <laughs> no contrast. <laughs> okay. This is the third floor in 1804, and when we finally get through our paperwork, I think it's the right word to put it in, yes, we will get there, okay? We'll move into that place space. It screams opportunity. Huh? It screams opportunity. It screams opportunity. <laughs> it's got to go bad, it's got to go up. Okay, let's go on. It screams fresh paint as well. Lead based paint, and just, just go through the bureaucracy of the whole thing. We won't go through that, because, yeah, we won't go through that. <laughs> Um, but 10 gigabit connection, close to the innovation hub, close to the smart cities, all those sorts of things. So really important to us to get into that space. Okay, challenges and opportunities. Siobhan asked me to talk a little bit about that going forward. Probably our biggest challenge is getting acceptance and market traction for the new ideas that we work through. Now, <coughs> Property Information was the first guys that we really did. So, Office of Environment and Heritage asked us to help them process LIDARs because the land and property information guys weren't doing it fast enough to get the information they wanted. Peter, can I just ask what are LIDARs? Okay, sorry. Yep, no problem. So there are several ways to do remote sensing. One of them is to fly with a laser beam and shoot a laser beam onto the ground. Now when you put 500,000 of these a second out, you get a very good description of what the ground and trees and all those things look like. But it's a hugely dense data set. And because it's light, unlike imagery, so you can, you see people do it from photogrammetry, that stops on the first thing it hits. So you can't penetrate trees and go through all that sort of stuff. LiDAR will shoot through and tell you exactly what's underneath. So we did a project in Papua New Guinea where they were going through 60 metres of rainforest and we're still picking up ground colour in that space. Right. So, so that's light. So Land and Property Information had $10 million over four years to develop a model of New South Wales. They were going to do the first, the eastern third using LiDAR and the western third doing imagery, or the ADS uh, 40 series. Sorry, Peter. Yeah. Um, you, you're taking all that data of sort of the vertical, can you actually stratify that information? Can you actually, so you could actually just sort of go and look at what's minerals by, by the soil and what's on the soil? Uh, we can't get the LiDAR won't go below the ground but then we can use ground penetrating radar or a million other geophysics stuff and combine the data sets. So you can these things. Yeah, yeah. So, quite a part. Okay, then problem information, we'll get back to that. They're currently using A group to do their LiDAR classification. They would then part classify it, send it over to India. Eight weeks later, it would come back. They would then spend a long time, because the people would sit down and manually finish 
the classification of the LIDAR, so saying what's ground, what's trees, and what's water, and all that sort of stuff. Send it back. LPI would then spend the same amount of time as they did the first time checking it, then send it back again. This process went back and forth. So we developed our own automated LIDAR classification system, spent a long time working with LPI to get it tailored to what they want. But, and it was a time when New South Wales government first started talking about innovation and local innovation and all the rest of it. So we did two things with LPI. One was to sort out how to do their photogrammetry because they're having trouble meshing it at the end of their 100,000, at the edge of their 100,000 sheets. And then how to link that data to reality so that we'd get them to run LIDAR through the centre of each of their photogrammetry sheets and then LIDAR classification. They led two big contracts which would have been very good for us, okay? One to the incumbent, which is still turning it to India and doing all the things they're doing, and one to a Canadian company. And the reason we didn't get the one that went to the Canadian company, we just developed this whole technique specifically for LPI to pull the imagery together. We didn't rewrite in the application, in the tender we put in, just how much detail we put in it. The guys we've been working with weren't the guys that assessed it, even though they had input into it. They didn't make the decision. We didn't get the job and went to Canada. So, long road in that space, and that's part of the government. Roads and Maritime Services we've done a fair bit of work with, particularly Roads and Maritime Services traditionally run survey, which is string survey, using total stations and cross sections at 20 metre, 25 metre intervals, etc. <coughs> with the big construction boom that's happening at the moment in infrastructure, they're now being given much more mobile LIDAR. Now mobile LIDAR is 2,000 points per metre squared, it's huge. These guys can't process it, so to them what they're looking at is a noise. They can't turn it into anything else. So we did a fair bit of work with Roads and Maritime Services and they're just going, wow, this is brilliant, we really need this. We never got there because finance would have had to buy them new computers. And actually the computers I showed you earlier on were the ones that were still in Road and Maritime Services <laughs> office. So they're managing $9 billion per year about at this point in time in infrastructure. How they're signing off on contracts, because they can't see what they've been given, I've got no idea. But finance decided that wasn't going to happen. We did, however, have success. And we've had a fair bit of success in Western Australia. They're a bit more progressive than New South Wales. Main Roads, Western Australia, we're doing work with now where we're processing their LIDAR, storing it in the cloud, serving it up to them. There's a whole pilot study we're doing in that space. And that's been a real breakthrough for us. Steve put a lot of effort into that, and we're really pleased. Okay. So a bit of a mixed bag in that space. The government is always a challenge, and particularly when something's a bit different to get into it. We've been through a couple of sets of business advisors and a bit of effort in financing. One of them we had 10 months with them and went through due diligence with a multinational company that was very close to taking to buying us. They finally decided they didn't know enough about LIDAR, but more importantly, our platform is a new generation and completely different to what they had. So they'd spent 30 years acquiring other businesses to feed into the platform they had. That wasn't compatible with us. So they would have to retrain all their staff. Even though they're very interested, they couldn't take us on at that point in time. So we didn't get that space. Um, we went through with a group that were helping us try and find funding out of the states in bits and pieces. And that was about the time that the economy had a bit of a shift. And companies went from basically investing in tech companies like us to trying to partner and see what they did, or basically get them to do jobs or whatever else. So that's sort of it was a long and expensive path. <coughs> we then went to the bank to see if we could get some funding from the bank. And that was another very interesting experience. Any one of my employees could go and borrow a million dollars to buy a house. Not a problem. A company that shows the promise this has got for the rest of it couldn't borrow a cent. In the end, I personally borrowed money to keep this thing going. All right. We went down the accelerating commercialization path. Now, that was another exciting journey. <laughs> The first application we wrote, and the expression of interest we wrote, they said was the best one they'd ever read. We then spent 10 months working with our advisor in that space. And what the stuff I showed you earlier on, we were trying to develop something which we then called the MD Urban Resource Analyzer, Aura, okay? And it was to show you how to do trees and all that sort of stuff we showed, all right? That doesn't exist, that's not a product, that's not, et cetera, et cetera. Finally, we got told by actually Dave Fleming that accelerating commercialisation doesn't fund startups, so you're wasting time. But that was 10 months of hard effort in that space. So, haven't had a good success with that part of the government. On the industries, we ran into Rob Oliver and a few other guys in that space, but Rob in particular, through Business Growth Services. He did a lot of work with us formulating uh, a couple of years ago about what ND should look like, what we need to put in place. Did a really good job. Really impressed with, the effort, with what they've done and what they've provided us in that space. Dave Fleming, who's with Oz, Indust <coughs> Oz Industries and CSRO, through the Innovation Connection stuff, we've lined up and we're doing work with Newcastle Uni at this point in time. 
and that's going really well. And Dave's been really good support in that space. So there's some really good people out there. The collaboration component, we'll talk a little bit about. The industry, we've had some success and some failure. This idea of, well, I call it gladiator. Last one standing gets the job, or first one across the line gets the job versus collaboration. Doesn't quite get there, and even though you try and collaborate, the gladiator steps in. But the university starts going well. So, the future business model, <coughs> brand D. Providing scaled, scalable tailored solutions that we can deliver via SaaS software as a service. We've nearly got our, our software as a service we thought was going to take a couple of weeks, two years ago, two years <laughs> down the track. We've nearly got, we're nearly there. E-commerce we thought last June was going to take us a couple of weeks. It's nearly there as well. It all takes a lot longer. Part of the challenge is we're trying to serve up really big data sets over a very thin pipe and serve up very complex information and do processing on really big data sets really fast. And so we've had to completely streamline that whole process to get there. Um, so that's our SaaS offering is nearly ready to launch and we will launch on several fields pretty soon. Target consulting, we've been using consulting to help us get the knowledge base and the market knowledge and all that sort of the technical knowledge base and the market knowledge to go through. Once we understand that quite well, we move it into a SaaS environment to see if we can put through it. The other thing that we also do a fair bit of research. So last year, probably about 90% of, of our expenditure was based on research, full stop. This year it's probably about 70%, it's still fairly high. Next year we're hoping to get down to about 55, 50% thereabouts, but an important part of ND. One of the things we've been seeing is that we can handle spatial data. We can handle some, or geospatial data, sorry. We can handle some spatial data to go with geospatial data. But we also, what we do in this space works in time series at this end. And what works in time series works in this space, particularly when you start looking at things like mobile and LIDAR, because effectively they're a 3D thing, they're a 3D time series. Right through it. And so that, being able to offer that continuum of analytics and visualisation becomes quite important. So, working on that. As we've said before, research connections. We've been working with LiDAR capturers. There's not all LiDAR capturers are the same. And so we've been working closely with a group that we know we can get quality out of and we're about just in the process of forming a partnership with them. Um, we've been working with some global project managers that have got offices in 12 countries, eight countries across the world, 12 offices, and they're working in geophysics and our analytics could work in that space with them as well, so that's starting to come forward. There's a new generation uh, image capture company that will be flying at 20,000 feet and covering 15,000 kilometres squared a day when they get going. They're really good at image capture, they're not so good at analytics. They're really we're in the process of working with them to do the analytics to help them derive more information from that. And then the last one is we've also <coughs> been for about five years liaising back and forth and working with um, the second largest pediatric research hospital in the world, which I can't say what it is at the moment because we haven't quite finalised the deal, but we're getting close. And what they're doing is taking physiological data and then processing it so that it sits on the computer beside the bed in real time. And I'll give you a glimpse of what that looks like. But to put that into context, researchers in medical space at the moment will ask for data. It'll take the person that's got the data a couple of weeks to pull it all together for them. They'll then deliver it to the researcher who will then go through and find out if there's too many gaps in the data for them to use, they need to get another data set and all the rest of it. So this process goes on and on and on. Where we're heading to is that that will just be able to be downloaded, like we download LiDAR and all those sorts of things. Okay. So this is state space visualisation of medical data. So typically you will see stuff, but they've gone from 15 minute readings now to three second readings. They've gone from external readings to internal body readings. What you're seeing on the side over there is the red axis is heart rate, the green axis is respiratory rate, the blue axis is blood pressure. And you're looking at how that changes over time. And then the colour change on it is telling us what the dissolved oxygen level is as you run through it. The graph up the top here actually says this is the blood pressure history of that patient over their whole life that we didn't have overall record. This is the current set of data we're working on from there. And then you watch where things fit into that space. So all of a sudden doctors are starting to get to where they can make much more informed decisions about what's going on. You're no longer comparing something with a norm, like if my blood pressure is 90, is 150 over 95, therefore I'm crook. Well, probably not, but that's right. Yeah, so that's that part. This is pretty exciting for us going forward. So, is this, you're hoping to roll that forward as a product, a standalone product? Yeah. 
You got a training arm up here? <laughs> Look, we're still working out, but this opportunity we've been working on for five years, it's just starting to crystallise now. When we know more about it, we'll let you know. But yeah, it's, it is quite huge. So this is leading edge in medical stuff at this point. They can't process the data as fast or... So the fundamentals that we use in our MD processing have been employed in how they structure the data to do this. So when they used to put this data together, it was in an unstructured database. And to get an answer out of the unstructured data, in three days. It's been restructured now, they're getting answers in seconds. So step one to being able to get to bring it in real time inside the bed. So, yeah. And this one, just to show that people can contribute and do a great thing. So 10 million people about this time last year each had the opportunity to change a pixel in the drawing, in, in a, a base. And this is what was generated out of that. Now, interesting enough of that, not necessarily but we can interrogate that to find out what sequence they moved in, what the rate of change was, all those things, because that's where the data sits. Okay. Questions and discussion? Oh, we do, yeah. Yes, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, as a byproduct of all this stuff, we actually generate some pretty neat art. This one here. Is lobbies. And what you're looking at is actually an abstract mathematical derived field lobbies. So you're looking at the rate of change of slope of the surface and the ground across that whole area. And the white bits say it's changing really fast, and the blue bits say that it's not changing quite so fast. But when you look at the level of detail in this, you can zoom right into the metre by metre squared and still have that level of detail. So from an art point of view, we could make that 10 times as big and still have good high resolution in that space. Now, our guys that are doing all this analysis get to look at this stuff all the time because this is just the things they generate to help them understand what's going on and check it. So about two years ago, three years ago, I had an idea that we should actually be producing a lot. People have laughed at me. That's all good. So the guys have been sticking bits and pieces into what we call our gallery. And we're now working with one of the guys that works. Wife is a photographer artist and we're working with trying to develop that out as an art source. But, yeah. Is the art for sale? The art will be for sale for sure, yes work out how to roll all that out. So we've done trials with that at this point in time. There's a printer down the central case, which is the Ken Dunn one down there. We can email to them the files and tell them what we want with it. They'll then print it like that and distribute it to whoever it goes to across the world. So the scale of it. international, oh. I think I say international art competition. <laughs> so not, yeah, not 2016, we submitted actually that one into the international library competition and we got runner up. We got pipped at the post by a little bit right at the very end. We were in front for quite some time. We just got pipped at the post. So they actually contacted us this year to say, are you putting in another bit of art? <laughs> okay. Questions? Um, Peter, I've got an interest in IP law. Um, huge amount of innovation that you're dealing with. How, do you, how did you approach issues of managing IP law? Is it just on a confidentiality basis or uh, Very good question. Um, we've got patents in place. We've been working with Shelston's IP mm -hmm. to help us in that space. We're not naive. We put in NDAs, memorandums of understanding, all this sort of stuff. But the reality is you can't hold it, you can't contain it. Now, the reason we take out patents is to ensure that no one stops us from being able to use what we've generated in the first place. It's our prior art, we can continue to go with it. If we want to take on IBMs and others for using it, probably we wouldn't try to do that. But then the only other solution for us is to just stay in front of the gate, go for it. So the heavy research and development thing is about protecting what we've got, but also about taking this thing that is scalable to all the areas that it could be taken, mm -hmm. going But yes, it's a challenge in that space. And if we start to license it, because this workflow, 80% of the workflow is common to everything, mm -hmm. pretty much. And then there's bespoke bits that get put in to do tasks. How do you license that to someone and who owns which bit and all that stuff? So we've been working through that and we've got some ideas. We basically, each one of the workflows that we do can be plug and drop through it. And effectively, like when you go to the paint shop and you say, I want this paint, and they dial in the numbers. If you want something done, we'll dial in the numbers. It'll pull together that workflow. And that is what's licensed and that's what'll go out. And that version of it is what you've been licensed to. That's where we think there. 
that's not been done before, like I say. All right. So there's two two components to what you're doing. There's one which is uh, if someone has a mass of data, yep. you can go and analyse it and give them a, a report. And there's but there's another part which would be if someone has an ongoing problem with data, you can write programming and sell them or license the program to them. Yep. So that's the two arms of your business. But in short, yes. And then there's art. <laughs> <laughs> don't don't underestimate. <laughs> We actually started using the art because it's too hard to explain to people what we're doing. They don't get it. But if you show them a bit of art and they get interested in it, and then you tell them the story behind it, then you can have a conversation. Well, when, when you put up the thing about the, the Mali Fowl mounds, yeah. and all, all I heard was this wide, and, and we're taking slices this wide, and um, so that's, that sounds rough as guts. And then I'm thinking, if this works, there must be you know a thousand applications for doing that across urban areas. You know, yeah. the pools that have got pool fencing, all things like that. Yeah. So, um, so the so the potential of what you're doing sounds enormous. To the extent that we will probably start our challenge at the moment is getting good enough data to be able to do all the things that people want because, like everything else. A 25,000 topographic map was good enough once. Yes. It's not anymore. And when you start serving up LIDAR, which will be I collect at one to two points a metre squared, yeah, I can see it, but it's a bit grainy. When you start serving up the same stuff at 20 points a metre squared with high resolution imagery draped all over it, people are going, yeah, that's what I want. So we're, one of the reasons we've been working with is LIDAR capture guys and getting them to a space where we can get their data fast and process it efficiently and cost effectively is so that we can then launch the rest of our SAS products. But we could tell you, if you told us where the park benches were, we could tell you what the shading of those park benches were, proximity of branches to the park benches, nearest access, etc., etc. And then the information's there. That's why. Yeah. Disability access. Where are all the areas that are grade of less than this across yes. whole cities? Yeah. What's the solar potential of Sydney? How close have they got in terms of uptake to fulfilling all of that solar potential? Yeah. yeah. This is yeah. it's a powerful tool. Yeah, I don't know how. Yeah, I don't know how you contain all of that in your head and work out um, you know, where where are the where are the markets. Uh, you know, who are the people? Presumably, you've got to have a lot of money. Uh, the, the clients have to have a lot of money and a huge amount of data and put it through a supercomputer and the and the benefits that they would get from that anal analysis have to be enormous. Yeah. Um, not necessarily, because we can do little bits, we can do big bits and you know, run through. And like we have the API I showed you earlier on, or the app for the solar stuff. We've got guys that dial in and cost them $2.50 to put an address to get the information back. So they don't need a huge amount of money. From an innovation space point of view, people have some great ideas, but they don't have the data to fire those great ideas. Yeah. We go back to Google, make sure I didn't talk about that. Google Maps, basically, in Google Navigation, 240 countries across the world. Navigation, 110 countries across the world. If you think about what that saves Sydney by people using those maps and distributing traffic across and not getting frustrated, Sydney alone in that space, it's huge. But more than that, it means that people who want to become taxi drivers, used to take six months to train up, are now one day to train up and not have enough taxi drivers. And then businesses like Uber all of a sudden can start because that thing was there in the first place. So what we want to do with MDD is get enough of a knowledge base in there that people can start to pull that information from. And if we can combine what we've got spatially with what the telcos are picking up about distribution and all those sorts of things, it becomes really powerful. Um, Peter, does the, start, you mentioned LPI is you know, collaboration. Does the, the sale of LPI offer you some opportunity to a private enterprise and in terms of the products that you might generate for them, they give you access to market? It could. <coughs> right at this point in time, we put so much effort into LPI over the last X number of years until two years ago, I think, mean, that it hasn't, I haven't had the will <laughs> to go back. Seriously. Mm. We, we put a lot of effort into, we got this thing and 
the model that we were talking about with them was where they would have NDD's classification system sitting in their offices and they'd be using it rather than us doing it and going from there. But, yeah. So, there's a huge opportunity there. I think the smart, the faster opportunity is for us to work with those that are capturing them, the data, and then just generate the products that they would have generated anyway. Okay? And if you look at like the, like, the image capture guys we're talking about, are talking about capturing all of Australia at least once a year. All right, all the cities four times a year, but all of Australia at least once a year. If we can derive a 3D point cloud from their data, which is a technical challenge at this point in time, but not impossible, then we can have that information across all of Australia. And then you can start to do things like look at ecotones and look at where climate change, what's moved, what has, and a whole heap of other things in that space. So. Yeah. Mm. Interested in your path from consultancy to ND. It sounds like a lot of consultancies you um, you would do jobs for uh, for customers and then realise that the IP that you were generating for them had uh, had more general applications. found anything that we can't at this point in time, but <clears throat> most of the, two answers to that question. Most of the companies we work with that we're doing this sort of processing for don't have the capacity to utilise what we generate anyway. They really want it dumbed down and dumped out in a GIS or an Excel spreadsheet, as we showed you there. They can't go beyond that. The project we did in Central America, where we had to completely rewrite our algorithms to pick up buildings and things because the data was just so bad, all right, that process actually led to us understanding better, even with good data, how we can streamline that process going forward. And we can get better resolution out of our good data now than we could before we did that because we were working with such bad data there. So it mostly does link into it. And the granular nature of the NDD platform is that you improve this plugin or algorithm a bit that has application in all sorts of other places. And it sounds like the type of clients that you work with aren't interested in So not very well so far. We will probably come across some down the track, but we'll see what we The geophysics guys that we talked about in there earlier on, they just acquired a geophysics company. They have a backlog of data like you wouldn't believe. And they have geophysics, typically they'll do really dense information for geophysics, and they'll take one small piece every 100 metres, and that's all they'll process. So there's all this other data in between that that no one's ever been able to process because it's too big that has much more information and so we'll see what happens. But it, you know, the hospital one, we will share the IP with the hospital guys going forward and work through that. In that geophysics case, we would share the IP and get benefits out of it. But back to your question about IP, then it becomes quite challenging about how you do all that. And that's, you know, I'm a technical person trying to understand that's another whole world. But we've got some good people working with us, but some really good people. So. You said you were processing overseas. You see pushing all the work overseas to create computers or something? So we have um, what our application running on a supercomputer in Canada, and it's really research-based at this point in time. They would commercialise and run. We haven't got enough traction in the outside world, and we're still developing things well enough to be able to do it. But the idea is that we could run our system on any computer anywhere across the world, and we can do it from here. So the Palsy supercomputer in Perth, Western Australia, is utilised about 40 to 50% of the time. We get a nice high-speed connection out of 1804 to that, It'd be very nice. That'd be more of a challenge. I, yeah, bureaucracy. Yeah. We've, we've run stuff on the NCI supercomputer in Canberra. We told them up front what we needed. We're doing it for Geoscience Australia. They said, no, you can't have that. After five iterations, six iterations, they finally gave us what we asked for. They then said, this took much longer than you said it was going to take. But we processed it for a day when they finally gave us what we asked for. All right? This is you're talking before about the GIS information with Google. Yep. Do you see them as a potential collaborator for what you're doing? And where's the crossover between their GIS side? Is that the wrong question to ask? Really? No, it's not the wrong, it's not the wrong <laughs> Your face just went. <laughs> I'd love to be able to tap into the information, for indeed you got to tap into the information Google has and generate a whole lot of things they haven't thought about. Where Google goes, 
who knows in that space. There is potential in, in all that. It's like with Telstra and anyone else that's collecting data. There's huge potential to collaborate in that space. Whether we get there, is another story. But yes, it's a huge set. Well, when you look into the crystal ball, what's, what's something that you can uh, see you might be telling us in five years time uh, where you can say, yeah, I, you know, I always knew that if I if I could get this data from this place and do this crunching, that it would blow us all apart in terms of wow. Is, is there something, a dream across the horizon? Uh, five years is too far out. Two years, because it's changing that fast. It's going to. Um, I'd love to be able to get to where you could look at a city like Newcastle know in ultimate dimensions where people are travelling from to what the use, you know, not the people themselves, but the statistics, statistics yeah. on that, all that, and be able to plan the city so that we could stay a 30 minute city for yes. years into the future, all right? Yes. We've got the technology, we've got the capacity to do that, we would need to get data from certain people to be able to work through that, but we could do it. You change town planning from being a two dimensional thing to a six dimensional thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's one. Yeah. The question is who's prepared to pay for that's a very good question. Yeah. Yeah. If all this came building and building, I'm yeah. just wondering whether the weakness in the ecosystem of mobilisation the market doesn't know how to make value of your product. Yep. So without giving away too many trade secrets, um, we know that. And part of our challenge historically has been waiting for contracts to come up, hiding behind a rock, waiting for a contract to come up to get a job. And when you start dealing with things like councils, and you look at the planning cycle for them and all that stuff, it's impossible. But there's an alternative way to do that. And that is just provide the product that they, we know they want. Not go through the whole tender process, they just want $10,000 worth of this or $5,000 worth of that. We would need to capture the data to do that, which is part of the funding thing we need to do, but that's what we need. Yep. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's how to classic problem that you had a department wanting to start, but wouldn't actually run it because it is a bit confusing. So the job we're doing with West Australian main roads at this point in time is all that will sit in the cloud. The data will be there. The remote guys that are in rural areas that can't access at this point in time, they drive to Perth to get access to the data. They'll be able to dial in, pull all the information out they need, dial out. That's where it'll be. And when we start to get to that stage, we've already set up a data library effectively. We know what data's been produced where and you keep tabs on it so you get access to the lots of stuff. The Mallyfowl stuff we were talking about before. We've nearly got the National Mallyfowl Recovery Group to a stage where they're going to identify all the areas they want done, and then as planes and anything else is travelling over those areas, we'll collect data and add it into that sort of space so it builds up going forward. And ideally, you get to the same space, a marketplace we talked about in there, where you're with councils and things, and they say, if you're in this area, we want this system stuff. Okay. And then it becomes worthwhile to do it. Or you partner up with someone who's doing imagery and get the imagery to where you can get enough analytics out of it to just use what's there because it's regular and high resolution. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so at the moment, you're, you're not really looking at the major target markets seem to be local government and state governments. Is that right? Where are you getting most of your pull from? Uh, local government, we're getting interest. I wouldn't say pull. State government, not a lot of interest. We need market from private operators and that sort of space. The solar industry, we've got a fair bit of traction in that space. Property industry, we're starting through our API and starting to get some traction there. And, so, and that's probably where it'll be. Nothing in the agricultural sector? The agricultural sector fits with what we're doing. And we're having some discussions with CSIRO in that space right now. And so you're specifically packaging products now that are sort of use your base for the I have a question from someone that's watching the live stream at DSA. Um, they wanted to know if LIDAR can reach through bodies of water or is it just limited to land? So I think sort of around mapping water beds and things like that. Okay. Two types of LIDAR. The LIDAR that we use is near infrared mm -hmm. and it won't shoot through water, it bounces off water. But there is what they call green LIDAR and it will go through water. So OEH, the images I showed you of Stockton Beach earlier on, OEH has a contract 
must be about to award right now to fly all of New South Wales coast and they'll use what they call LADS LIDAR for that which is a different, it's multiple stacked and it'll get down to the depth it needs to get to and pick it up from there. Yep. What's your end game? <laughs> the end game is to get to where we have an end lead, we, we have a capacity to provide a whole heap of very useful information to people to use going forward. End game in terms of exit or end game commercial point of view. Commercial point of view. Yeah. But there is no end game at this point in time in that space. We want to there's been a lot of smart people put a lot of effort in to get this to where it is. We want to see it fly. Once we get past seeing it fly, then we'll see where we go. Mm -hmm. But we've made it this far. It's been a long road. A very tight shoestring a lot of times. <laughs> <laughs> you, said, you said you were picking up some international business though. Yeah. Like South America and the like. Yeah. Um, and and there opportunities overseas? Ah, there's lots of opportunities. We've really been focusing on getting everything tight enough to be able to then go and launch out. Like I think I said before, we're nearly at the stage that we might I was talking to you earlier on there nearly at the stage where the LiDAR classification that's done worldwide by first combination of using traditional automated classification and then sending to someone who sits on seat and picks out individual points and does it. We're nearly, to get to 99% or so accuracy, we're nearly at 99% automatically. Once we get that extra little step and have a time for a breath to work on it, we'll be in a position that we can provide that service globally. Yeah. Uh, I suppose I, I don't want to start thinking about this, but um, coastal erosion yep. seems to be where you, you can capture a lot of information now yep. um, and that would actually feed into quite a lot of countries planning about yep. floodplains and yep. coastal development. Yep, so it's huge. We did Wyong Coastline study back in 2005 I think and developed a model then that actually measured what was happening in terms of erosion looked at cliff faces and predicted what stability of each of the cliff faces would be and all those things based on the LIDAR information and the geology information we had. Yeah. So there's a whole risk assessment stuff going on as well. Yep. Interesting. It's huge market. Get the lawyers involved in that one. Yeah. Mm, yeah. But yeah, but the potential of it is quite enormous. So, yeah. I was just going to ask, with like detecting features in this space, so <coughs> what is a tree, what is a roof? At the moment, is that like a, a manual sort of process? A sort of I need to describe the features of what a roof looks like, or is that a automatically feature extraction sort of thing? Basically, we've gone through and used direct analytics yep. up until now. We've started oh, no, up until now. We've started using some machine learning to go supplement that going forward. So things like species, yep. tree species, trees we can pick up, yep. okay, and you can just tell from all sorts of features of them. And if it's got all these features, then it's a tree. Yep. Or if it's got all these features. It's that sort of stuff. Tree species though, you start to look at some of the metrics that come out of the colour, imagery and a whole range of other things in there and then what we've been doing is sending people out in the field, getting training sets and then cross matching those using machine learning to pull out information. So we did a project two years ago where we did about a thousand kilometres squared of re mine rehabilitation and the guys collected samples in the first place and parts of it but now we hear the whole thing and then we process the whole lot with some machine learning to get results out. So is there, um, I guess, uh, a business need for, to sort of have a better semantic understanding of what's actually out there? Like here's the Malibar Mound, but what else is out there? Something that we might be of interest, but I didn't know it was there in the first place. So council, let's, let's go back and look yeah. at councils, okay? I sat down the other day, now that we can do roof planes and all that stuff, we'll show to you. There's about 60 products we can generate. Right straight out of what we've got, the capacity we've got. It's a matter of having the time and the resources to actually generate those 60 products. Right. But the NDD workflow is such that we can set, them, set it up to do those 60 products in one pass yeah. and then just have them sitting there and then people can tap into them and go from that point, which is why things like supercomputers are quite interesting. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So you provide a range of APIs here? Steve? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 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 But, but the guys have spent two years solidly setting up this whole cloud software as a service part in a way that is scalable. All right, it's not just we haven't rushed to market just to do this bit because we know there's 60 other products and we already the guys are serving in property and solar now. Can you add that feature? Can you add that feature? Can you do this? Can you do that? So we can do it. 
but I, I just got to get through. It'll be interesting if you get pressure from that side of things, where the people want to provide the service as well. Mm. We'll be busy talking it up and why don't you have an API so they can sell a product. It's a whole new space for us at this point in time. We've got new as in the last two years. We've spent probably 18 years working on the technology, thinking about it. Getting it. 2012, we stepped back and said, if we're going to continue to process these really big data sets, what are the fundamentals of doing it? We wrote out our fundamental principles and we built the C++ NDD program in accordance with those principles. We revisited them about a year ago, contained all of those principles all the way through, and they've stood us in really good stead. But it's been set up, and the same with the software as a service stuff, set up so that it's fully scaled. Might have to leave it there because I know everyone has a million questions, but I think some people need to go back to work and go back to uni. Um, but if you're happy to stick around, um, people can just come up and ask questions afterwards. Um, but yeah, thanks for thanks for being here. Um, really. Interesting.